I'd like to start today's presentation with a short story about education taken from a recent Time Magazine article. It's about a fictional person that we'll call Rip Van Winkle. Mr. Van Winkle awakens in the 21st century after a hundred years snooze and of course he's utterly bewildered by what he sees. Men and women dash about talking to small metal devices pinned to their ears. Young people sit at home on sofas moving miniature athletes around on electronic screens. Older folk defy death and disability with metronomes in their chests and hips made of metal and plastic. Airports, hospitals, shopping malls, Every place Rip goes just baffles him. But when he finally walks into a schoolroom, the old man knows exactly where he is. <laughs> this is a school, he declares. We used to have these back in 1911. Only now the blackboards are green. My talk today is about a world in which education looks completely different from 1911 and even 2011 for that matter. It's about two concepts that could sweep the landscape for education and make the education of tomorrow completely unrecognizable to someone looking back 100 years from now. The first concept that I want to talk about is one that I call the learning graph. And I define the learning graph as a complete digital record of everything that a person has learned. Now, this could be grammar, mathematics, scientific knowledge, really any concepts. As a student progresses through school, their learning is tracked and their level of mastery is being gauged. So it's what you've learned, but it's not just what you've learned, it's also when you've learned something. One of the things that um, is, ant is bizarre about our current education system is the fact that we have this antiquated notion that everybody needs to learn the same thing at the same point in time. A lot of this is so that we can say, she passed third grade and therefore we know that she knows these things. But how much more powerful would it be if we could simply track what a student has learned over time? And then they could be freed up to learn at the pace that's most comfortable to them. Finally, the learning graph could track how quickly someone is learning something. Now this is important because it helps us to identify where strengths and weaknesses are. You might be very strong in mathematics and, and weak in reading comprehension, and the learning graph would be able to track this. It also might be able to identify standouts. Maybe we identify the next Einstein or the next great scientist by how quickly they're picking up a certain topic. Now, building this learning graph would have been science fiction only a decade ago, but there are some companies that are actually building this as we speak, and I want to introduce you to some of them. First of all, um, how many people are familiar with the term adaptive learning engine? So a few hands went up. Um, I want to introduce you to adaptive learning engines. And the way that I want to describe this is to talk about an engine that basically measures the pace at which you're learning and allows you to move faster if you're picking up a subject more quickly and slows down if you're moving more slowly. Now, the great part about these engines and one of the most revolutionary things is that it actually allows every student to completely master every topic. So if you're falling behind, no longer do we have this notion that, well, you know, 70% of things, 80% of things you can move on. That 20%, that 30% might have been foundational for whatever comes next. If you're moving at a relatively slower pace with an adaptive learning engine, you're not going to hold back the people around you. You learn at your own pace. Now, a few of the companies that are building out these adaptive learning engines, one's name is Tenmarks. Um, they just announced the other week that they raised $3 million in funding. Another, run, uh, another one uh, is called Grokket. Uh, they just announced this week that they had raised $7 million in funding, $33 million total to date. Another one is named Newton. This month, they announced that they have raised $33 million in a single funding round. So if you do the math, just since school started this fall, $43 million has been put into just these three companies to help build out this learning graph. And even if you're not aware of these, many of you have probably seen the TED Talk that Salman Khan gave, and if you haven't, I'd highly recommend that be your Saturday evening homework. A lot of people talk, and in the press it's, it's mentioned frequently about the videos that Salman Khan created, but I think the most interesting thing is what he's done behind the scenes to build one of these adaptive learning engines. 
Now, what does this adaptive learning engine look like? I want to show you a diagram here, and, and this is a, uh, from a blog, and I think it was mentioned that everyone in the room is above 18, so it's called Kicking Ass at Khan Academy, which I think is an awesome name for a blog. And, and this is basically the learning graph made real. And you can see the interconnected nature of the topics here. Linear equations flow into graphing points, graphing points flow into functions, and so on. So it's an early representation of the learning graph, but I think it's a great indicator of what's to come. Now, what's fascinating about the learning graph is it represents an explosion in the amount of data that we have about students. In the past, we might have had a few test scores, we have a grade that we give you at the end of the course, but with this, there's literally an infinite amount of data that we can track about a student. Another reason why I think this is potentially disruptive is that it could actually eventually replace assessment. In a world where you're constantly being assessed by what you have learned, there's really no need to stop and test a student. We already know what they've learned because this learning graph is tracking this. So the learning graph, whether you think this is a good thing or not, could put an end to testing and assessment as we know it. Now, what does the learning graph miss? There's a lot, right? The learning graph is going to do a really poor job of telling us whether someone's creative, whether they can become the next artist. We're tracking people, they're answering multiple choice questions, so very hard to identify someone's artistic abilities. It probably doesn't do a very good job of telling us who would be a good leader and those interpersonal skills. Um, it's probably not going to tell us who a good communicator is. And, and finally, it's not going to do a good job of telling us who works in teams and get al gets along with others. We've all known many people who are very book smart, but who you'd never want to work with. So this is where the second concept comes into play. And this is something that I call the reputation graph. Now, my, reputa my definition of the reputation graph is that if the social graph is who you know, reputation graph is what you know about who you know. We all know an incredible amount about the people around us. We know who the all-stars are, who the slackers are, who we'd love to spend time with, who we shy away from. Now, for the entirety of human history, all of that information's really been kept in our heads. It's been siloed. And maybe, you know, you take someone out for beers and you ask them about somebody they've worked with in the past and they'll, they'll tell you the, the nitty-gritty, but for the most part, this information is, in, is siloed in their heads. That's starting to change, and there's a number of companies that are actually bringing the reputation graph to the web. Now, before I get to that, I want to talk about an example of the reputation graph that all of you are familiar with. <laughs> Senior superlatives. So these, this was either the most awesome or most frightening day when you were in high school. It was the day that the yearbook came out, and you got to see who was voted best dressed and friendliest and class clown. And what I want to talk about is most likely to succeed. Now, I've never seen the research done on this, but I bet you if you go back and you track who was voted most likely to succeed, and you compare them to your peers, over time, that person is probably in order of magnitude more successful. And what that says is that we know a lot about the people around us. Even way back in high school, we were able to gauge who the, the all-stars were. This is one of the rare times, though, that, that any of that reputation graph information ever was made public. Now, there's a number of companies that are building the reputation graph. I want to briefly just walk through them. There's a company uh, that's building this on the web called Mixtent, which asks you questions about people you've worked with in the past. They'll say, Steve and Sue, you've worked with them. Who's the harder worker? There's a company called Honestly.com, which actually has you write reviews about people that you know. Now, these are anonymous reviews, but you connect in with your Facebook account, so you get these reviews written about you. You know it's one of your friends. You just don't know who. <laughs> Clout is measuring social influence based on what you do on Twitter, who follows you, who retweets you. They've partnered with businesses, and if you go to certain hotel chains now, you might get a room upgrade on the basis of your Clout score. And finally, and this is my favorite one, is a website called GitHub, which probably no one in this room has heard of. But GitHub is a place where engineers go, they upload op open source code, and engineers follow other engineers on the basis of what code they've uploaded and whose projects they think are interesting. What's starting to happen now is people are starting to get jobs on the basis of their GitHub profile. So you can see where this might go. This notion that what we know about the people around us is incredibly important to our future. 
So you might be skeptical of these concepts, and some of these might, frankly, scare the crap out of you, and that's totally, totally fine. But what I want to end with is the main theme, which is that the age of data in education is upon us. We're going to generate more data in the next decade in education than we've de generated in the entirety of history up until this very moment. Now, I think for the most part that's a good thing. There probably will be some unintended negative consequences, but I think the most important thing is to understand what's going on and how this will change. My friend and, and visionary blogger wrote, it, wrote about this recently and her article was titled, The Dawn of Data as the Dusk of Degrees. So with that, I want to close and, and thank you for sharing a passion for a world in which an education system of tomorrow is better than the education system of today. Thank you.